Gospel. How are you today? Are you doing good? Well, we're glad that you're here today. I just have a couple announcements as we begin our service today. We have a baby shower for baby Adelaide today at 2 p.m. at the Fox Farm. So if you would like to come and celebrate baby, you can talk to Steph after church for any further details, but 2 p.m. at the Fox Farm. Um, we also have a sign up for Meals on Wheels for the month of August in the, in the foyer, so please sign up for that. And lastly, we want to say happy 21st birthday to Zach Fox. Happy birthday, Zach. 21, that's a big number. How did that happen? Okay, <laughs> we are going to watch Kids Church with Jelaine. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for joining me for Sunday School this morning. So last week, we, or last time we were together, we talked about how God keeps us safe when we're scared. And we talked about that big fiery furnace, right? It was a couple weeks ago. This week, we are going to talk about how God gives us what we need when we're scared, okay? So we're going to read a quick little story with pictures and then read the other one from our Bible again, okay? So... This is Elijah. Elijah was thirsty and needed some water to drink. So God told Elijah to go to a woman in the next town for some water and food. So he went to the next town and he met the woman. And he asked her for some water and for some bread. She's picking up sticks. I don't know why. I guess we'll maybe we'll find out. The woman told Elijah that she didn't have enough food left to make the bread. She only had enough for her and her son. Elijah told her, don't be afraid. He told her to make some bread first. God promised to take care of them. So the woman made the bread, as you saw in that last picture. The woman made some bread for Elijah. God gave Elijah the food he needed, and God gave the woman all the flour and oil she needed forever. God will give you what you need, too. So God promised that he would provide for them, right? For Elijah, for food and water, and for the woman, for enough food to make the bread, right? And they both got what God promised them. So let's read it again in our Bibles here. And this story is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and we're going to start in verse 8 all the way down to 16 okay then the lord said to elijah go and live in the village near the city of sidon i have instructed a woman there to feed you so he went there and as he arrived at the gates of the village he saw a widow gathering sticks and he asked her would you please bring me a little water in a cup as she was going to get it he called to her Bring me a bite of bread, too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a little handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. That's what the sticks were for, I guess. But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did, did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord, as the Lord had promised through Elijah. So God made well on his promises, right? Um, so I think that's a really great story, right? Because she was ready to have her last meal with her son before they didn't have any food left and they would starve, right? Even though the woman was afraid that her and her family would starve, she still trusted God and obeyed what he said, right? She gave her very last food to a stranger and God provided for the woman just like he said he would. God will provide for us too, right? When God asks us to do something that maybe we're a little bit afraid to do or nervous to do, 
He will give us what we need to get through it. So, one way to remember this story, and it's a good one, is by practicing our memory verse, right? So, I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. That's in Psalm 34, verse 4. Now, nobody so far has told me that they're practicing their memory verse. So, I don't know if you're doing it unless you tell me. So, let me know if you're practicing your memory verse. And at the end of this curriculum, I think there's three weeks left, I will get you a prize, okay? So you have three weeks to practice your memory verse and let me know, okay? So that's all I have for today. I will see you next week. Thanks for joining me. Nobody has practiced their memory verse yet. I hope next week that changes a little bit. Hey, Cooper girls. <laughs> Holidays are over. Well, we want to welcome you to church today. And uh, for kids, if you didn't already get the new coloring sheets, there's some new coloring sheets uh, by the Sunday School Room. You can get those. Uh, and they are about today's story that Jelaine shared with us. And we're going to open up our service in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that we can be here uh, as your body, worshiping in Eston. God, we pray that you would come and speak to us today, that as we open our hearts and pour them out to you, God, that you would, that you would visit us, that you would speak to us. We welcome you into this place and into our lives. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can gather. We thank you that we can honor you, that your name would be made great today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we uh, enter into worship, if you're going to sing, we would ask that you wear a mask. And Brayden, thank you for leading us in worship today. I'll invite you to stand with us this morning as we worship. <clears throat> breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life So that I could be set free Oh, Jesus, I see all that you've done for me we're 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give. You give and take away. Give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Name. Let's sing that one more time. Be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The hope of nations. Savior. Can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me. All my fears and failures Fill my life again Give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Say, oh, He can move the mountain my God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. Of the risen King, say, oh, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. The splendor of the King. Oh, Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. And how great is all. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great and how great is our God. Age to age he stands in 
that you would be exalted in each one of our lives today. That your greatness would shine through in everything that we do. That your name would be the name above all names. And God, as we continue on in our service today, God, we pray for those who are struggling. God, we are, whether they're struggling with sickness, or God, or whether they're struggling with fear or loneliness, God, I pray that you would be with them today, that your greatness would shine through in their life today. God, that you would be their comfort, that you would be their joy, that you would be their companion. And God, that you would bring us alongside to support and encourage and love those who are maybe living in fear. God, who are living with sickness or who have lost loved ones. God, I pray that you would help us to be your hands and your feet to those in our community and in our, our community of faith. God, we pray that you would be glorified today in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. It's nice not to have to do uh, that as well as preach. So it's great to have people you can rely on to do that. But Braden and Lisa will not be with us for too much longer. So we're going to, in a couple of weeks, we're going to pray for them. They have, uh, they're doing Braden's internship in BC. Shucks. but we want to make sure that we bless them as they go. They've been a blessing to us. So today I want to talk to you a, a little bit about, well, not about parties. We're not talking about parties. But about, you know, maybe having a dinner party. Um, 
many of you don't know my extended family, and that's fine, but my uncle, yeah, you don't want to. We're going to talk about that in a minute. No. Um, my dad's youngest sibling, uh, his name is Myron. So my uncle Myron is everyone's favorite guest. Um, and I'm not saying that facetiously. He, he did that stand-up comedy for a little bit on the circuit in Alberta and Saskatchewan when he was younger. He's hilarious. Everybody loves having my Uncle Myron at their house, whether for a dinner party or a party or a celebration, any type of gathering, whether it's a family gathering or not, he's the first person you want on the list because he is so much fun. He always fills, you know, the awkward silence? He's always got something good in that, in that period of time. And um, he, he's got an amazing way of telling stories, and he brings it to life, and he makes everyone feel welcome wherever he goes. My Uncle Myron is my favorite guest, and you would want him at a guest at your house, too. I promise. On the flip side, <clears throat> every family has that person that you, you're slightly hesitant to invite. Maybe they make things seem a little bit awkward, or they don't know how to engage in appropriate conversation, or they don't have a, a great handle on social cues. We all have one of these people in our, at least our friend circle, and maybe our family circle as well. Have you ever had that, that celebration, that gathering, or that party, and you just hope that that strange relative doesn't show up? Or that, that really awkward friend? You're like, ah, uh, you know, it's open for everybody, but I really hope that they don't come. Uh, you know that person who's a little bit weird and makes things awkward? Maybe they're the ones who says the inappropriate comments all the time or they show up already heavily marinated in some sort of sauce. You know, we, all ha we know somebody that's kind of like that. That makes those gatherings a bit awkward. And if you don't, maybe you're that person. Mostly joking. Well, today our story looks at an event where this happens to a man named Simon where an uninvited guest shows up at his dinner party. So if you would turn with me to Luke 7, and we're going to read verses 36 to 50. Luke 7, 36 to 50, and as we go there today, I'm just going to quickly pray. Um, so join me as I pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would have something for each one of us today, myself included, that you would speak to me, to us, and that any words that I say that might be distracting or take away from what you're trying to speak to us would just fall by the wayside, and that you would shine through. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're looking in Luke 7. Last week I looked at Luke 17. I've got a thing with sevens, I guess. Luke 7 Verses 36 to 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet, and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He, she's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then G Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly 
forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So this week I was, as I was going over this passage, I read it a number of times, and it, it had been highlighted to me a couple of times last week as I was uh, just reading through Scripture and different things like that. And so I was drawn to go a little bit deeper into this, this passage of Scripture. And I noticed a few things. I had a few observations right off the bat. Um, Jesus was actually invited to a Pharisee's home for some sort of gathering. Uh, it says, uh, we know that there's a gathering because verse 49 says that the men at the table, the men sitting among the table, so there was more than just Jesus and uh, Simon the Pharisee. So it's some sort of, of gathering. And uh, he's with, it would seem, uh, Pharisees and people who follow the law very strictly. And if you remember, the Pharisees, they are a religious, a Jewish religious sect that held a lot of authority at Jesus' time. And they believed that in order for Israel to be redeemed from their Roman captors, from their Roman invaders, that they must strictly adhere to the laws of Moses. They needed to follow all the laws that were laid out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, follow those laws to a T. And they added a couple hundred extra ones just in case they, you know, they weren't quite able to get everybody in line with those ones in the Old Testament. Um, but they believed that if only they could follow these laws and be perfect, that Israel could be saved, that the Redeemer, the redemption would come. Only living this holy life would lead to redemption. Now, Jesus is hanging out with these guys. He's invited to their house, the house of a Pharisee. We don't normally see Jesus invited by Pharisees, but it kind of makes sense because Jesus knew the Scriptures very well. He was a teacher. Um, Simon refers to him as teacher. And so, uh, you know, it isn't actually that odd that Jesus would be invited to the house of a Pharisee. But the Pharisees thought that they knew the keys to the kingdom. They thought they knew how they would be redeemed. But Jesus was the only one who knew that. The Pharisees were only striving by doing good works and keeping the law. So they're hanging out at this house, having a meal together, and in walks this woman. A woman of poor reputation comes onto the scene. Now this woman is known in the community probably as a prostitute. And she has made her living by being a prostitute. And she is very well known in her city, in her, in her neighborhood. And some people have speculated that maybe this woman is Mary Magdalene. Um, I don't know if that's true. Uh, just in reading some things, I won't get into it, but <clears throat> uh, Gregory the Great, great name, is actually the one who kind of 
started this theory off, and he wasn't around when this story was written, so he just kind of made an assumption. But if you read in chapter 8, Mary Magdalene is actually named in verse 3. So this unnamed woman probably isn't Mary Magdalene, and that's, how we'll, that's the way we'll drive today. She's probably not Mary Magdalene, because Luke names her a few verses later in a different context. So this unnamed woman, this woman with a very poor reputation in town, she comes and she begins to weep uncontrollably. So much so that Jesus' feet are visibly wet with her tears. And then she begins to wipe the tears off with her hair. I can't think of many more things disgusting than that. I'm not a big feet person. So, and I've been at, I've been at the river for the last week wearing flip-flops all day, walking to the pool and back, and then to the pool again and back. And my feet are not pleasant. Think about Jesus' feet where they, in, you know, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, where they, their feet are just, they're walking in sandals all the time on dry, dusty roads. And she is wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. I just think of the love. My wife asked me to massage her feet sometimes, and I'm just like, oh, please, no. Go have a bath first. But she is weeping at Jesus' feet, wiping the tears off with her hair. And then that, that's another thing. I'm glad I don't have long hair to do that. But in Jewish culture at that time, it was very inappropriate for a woman to let down her house, house, let down her hair outside of her own house. It was very, it was actually a very intimate sign that usually it was only done in the confines with the husband in their bedroom. So the fact that this is happening out in the open in somebody else's house and wiping someone's feet with her hair who is not her husband, this is scandalous. This is, this has a making to ruin Jesus. And not only was she wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, she was kissing them uncontrollably. I only like kissing babies' feet because babies don't walk yet. But she is uncontrollably kissing his feet just continuously and continuously and anointing them with expensive perfume. As I was reading, I was, think, I was thinking, you know what? This woman had to have had an encounter with Jesus before. She had to have met Jesus before. Because she bursts onto the scene with radical love. Could this woman have had a heavy burden lifted? and experience the forgiving love of Christ. This, I can only think that this would have had to have happened at some earlier point because she comes in and she immediately is at his feet weeping with love and adoration. On the other side of the picture, you have Simon. Simon is indignant because of what this woman is doing. But Jesus knows the thoughts and hearts of Simon. Simon questions in, this, in his heart who Jesus is. He calls him teacher, but he's questioning who... I don't know if this guy really is who people think he is. He says in verse 39, he thinks, if this man, if this man were a prophet, 
he would know the kind of woman who is touching him. She is a sinner. Simon wouldn't have had Jesus into his home if there wasn't something that intrigued him a little bit. We don't know if he was trying to trap him because we know that the Pharisees and the religious leaders were always trying to catch Jesus off guard. But there was some, but he, he calls him teacher. He invites him to his home. So there is some intrigue that is taking place. But Simon is so blinded by trying to live rightly that there is little to no forgiveness or gratitude in his heart. And Jesus, knowing Simon's heart, tells this parable. And he knows it will speak to the situation. I'll just quickly tell it again. Then Jesus told a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, and 500 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? 500 pieces of silver, uh, in, maybe in your translation of the Bible it says denarii. 500 denarii was equivalent to about 20 months' wages. 50 pieces a silver 50 denarii was equivalent to about two months' wages. I can do math. Actually, I read it. <laughs> but both of these amounts were debts that these men could not pay. It didn't matter if it was little or great. Neither man could pay what they owed. It would have been impossible for them to pay that back. But because of the benevolence of their creditor, they were both freed from the bondage of trying to pay back what they owed. I love what it says in verse 42. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Both debtors had been kindly forgiven in this story. And Jesus asks Simon, who will love the, their creditor more? Which, which one do you think? Which one is going to love their creditor more? The one with 50 or the one with 500? And Simon points out, the one who had the bigger debt would probably love G, uh, the creditor more. Jesus then points out something that is taking place right in front of them. He stops and turns the parable into something that is happening right now. That is a teaching moment. And Jesus does that with all of his parables. They're always teaching moments. And we don't always understand them. And the disciples didn't always understand the parables. But right then and there, Jesus points out what is going on in the house of Simon. Jesus points out the lack of gratitude and honor shown to him by his host. And the love showered upon him by this sinner. Remember, Jesus is an invited guest to Simon's. It's not like Jesus just showed up. He, Jesus wasn't the uninvited guest. Jesus was invited to Simon's house. Yet little to no hospitality has been shown. Simon neglected to even offer Jesus water to wash his feet. There are some customary things that we don't do in Canada we don't wash each other's feet very often. Sometimes we do in, in Christian circles when we're remembering uh, when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. But this was something that took place on a regular basis. And if you were invited into someone's home, that was something you made sure that there was water provided so that they could wash their feet. Or someone would come and wash their feet. And Simon provided no such hospitality at all. Simon neglected even to offer water to Jesus for him to wash his own feet, which would have been customary. Yet, this sinner, this woman, has washed Christ's feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. We don't normally greet each other with kisses. Some cultures do. We don't. And especially not now with 
everything that's going on. I guess we could kiss with masks on. That would be weird. Actually, I kissed Kasia with a mask on, right? It's weird. Anyways. But we don't normally greet each other with a kiss. Some people do. And it's always a little bit weird, right? Oh, they kissed me. That's different. But it was customary in those days. And again, if you were in an invited guest, that would be something that would be expected. And so Simon does not even greet Jesus with a kiss. Customary for a guest entering your home. Yet here this woman, this sinner, as Simon would say, has not stopped kissing Christ's feet. And when you entered a home in the Middle East, something such as olive oil would be provided for you to use on your head to help you feel refreshed. And that would be a minimal requirement for a guest entering your home. Maybe even for someone who is uninvited. But this was not even provided by Simon. Yet this woman has anointed Christ's feet. Not his head, but his feet. And she didn't use olive oil. She used an expensive perfume, a costly perfume. And Jesus points out this to Simon in verse 47. He says, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. Jesus says her sins, and they were many, like the like the insurmountable 500, 20 months worth wages that she could never pay back. Her sins she could never pay back. There was no chance of that ever happening. She was so far in debt that she was lost in her sin. She has been forgiven, and so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. I love that Jesus doesn't linger on Simon's lack of hospitality. He moves directly to the woman. In verse 48, and he says, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So as I was reading this this week and reflecting on what this means for how do you preach this on Sunday morning and how, what does this mean for my life, I thought, you know, sometimes we lose sight of the forgiveness that Jesus has for all of us, big or small. I have to check my heart on a regular basis. I have been raised in a Christian home with strong Christian parents. I was raised with Christian teaching, always going to church and Sunday school and Bible camp and VBS. And even when church wasn't open to everybody else, I was still there because my dad was a pastor. And you know what? I never strayed too far off the path. I always stuck pretty close to home. And I can take this for granted. I think Josh had mentioned it on Father's Day, that he's, he said something like, I don't have much of a testimony. He, that always bothered him. I don't have much of a testimony, and I don't know if that bothered me. Maybe I, I, I tried once to work on my testimony. It didn't go well. But, you know, in short, I know the law. I could be just like Simon. I know the scriptures. I know what's right, and I know what's wrong. But I have to ensure that I do not rely on the law, but the forgiveness and grace poured out by Jesus. See, I've had an encounter with the living God, and I need to make sure that that changes me every single day. But I can become like Simon. My dad, on the other hand, he was saved out of a life of destruction. 
he had dropped out of school, and he was living a life trying to prove himself. He was caught up in drugs and alcohol, and, you know, he was, he was headed for prison. He was headed for a life that might have looked similar to this unnamed woman. And then my dad had a radical encounter with Jesus. And that night, he was instantly set free, and he felt forgiveness and love. My dad understands what it means to be forgiven for much. And you can, when my dad goes to different places and he's telling people about Jesus, he becomes alive because he knows that the debt that he owed, he couldn't pay. He would never be able to repay. But Jesus kindly forgave that and reached out to him. And I need to remember that Jesus kindly reached out to to me. And Jesus kindly reached out to each one of you and forgave that debt. Each one of us has been forgiven from a so-called life of sin or not. We've all been forgiven and we each have the opportunity to be forgiven today if it's much or little. I have a friend who pastors the Victory Church in Saskatoon and their slogan is no perfect people. I like that because each one of us is on a level playing field. Romans 3.23 puts it this way, for all have sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Eugene Peterson in the message puts it like this. He says, since we've compiled a long and sorry record as sinners, both both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself. I love that. Out of sheer generosity, that kindness that the creditor had for his debtors. Where are our hearts at today? Today maybe you are or were like the the debtor who owed 500 denarii. Or maybe you're like the one who owed 50. Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty seven says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The best part about this story is that there is forgiveness for both. And how are we going to respond to Jesus today? I pray that each one of us would respond the same way as the unnamed woman in this story. That we would respond to Jesus in worship and adoration with our hearts full of love for what he did for us. It's easy to sometimes forget. I do. It's easy to forget what Christ has done for us. Not to forget, but just to live not fully remembering. And so today, I would, my prayer is that each one of us would remember how Christ kindly paid our debt and out of his sheer generosity put us in right standing with God. I don't normally read prayers because sometimes I find them a little bit rote and hard. But I found this prayer this week. So as I close today, listen to the words of this prayer. And if they resonate with you, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would just speak to us today. Lord Jesus, 
I show up in this story in many places. I'm Simon the self-righteous Pharisee. Too often I look at people through the lens of criticism and quick judgment, especially if their actions hurt, irritate, or inconvenience me, or if their sins are simply different than mine. I grieve this, Lord. Forgive me for my arrogance and self-righteousness. That is not who I want to be. I'm also this broken woman at your feet. My sins are just as ugly and numerous as hers, just not as public or notorious. I honestly believe this, but your Holy Spirit, but by your Holy Spirit, convince me even more that it is true. My creed is that you've forgiven all of my sins, past, present, and future, for which I give you praise. But Jesus, help me to live out what I believe each and every day. Jesus, help me change. Help me, change me, and free me. I want a heart of humility, gratitude, and love for you, like I see in this woman. Lord, I want to forgive others quicker and from the heart, just as you've forgiven us. I want to love you much more today than I currently do. You love us more than we could possibly imagine or hope. Grant me grace, Lord Jesus, especially for the people who have brought me the biggest hurt, shame, and pain. And today, Lord, as we move from this place and go home, that we would understand to a greater degree how you saved us. And God, that we, would, that we would come to you in love and adoration. And in front of everybody, that we would show that gratitude for what you have done for us. That we would lay our lives down at your feet. That we would pour ourselves out at your feet, just like this lady poured out that expensive, costly perfume. And that we would understand what it means to be forgiven each and every day. God, help me to not just believe that I'm doing right, therefore I am right. But Lord, help me to live out what I believe and live out what you did for me each and every day. So, Lord Jesus, as we leave this place, we pray that you would be glorified in our lives, that you would be exalted, and that as we go from here, we would go proclaiming your goodness to those around us. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. It is great to be able to get together like this. Um, next week, we have a guest speaker, Dan McNaughton, who is uh, the, our district representative for uh, ACOP. He's going to be here preaching, so I know that God has given him a word for us for next week. So same time. Same place. As you leave today, I pray that you would go in the forgiveness of Christ. Thank you for being with us. The service is dismissed.